Hello and welcome to All Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Maury of Drea Renee Knits and this is a little weekly podcast where I try my best to answer some of your questions. So today I am wearing the DRK Everyday Pullover. It is really feeling like autumn has arrived here in Maine. It has been delightful. A little on the crisp side outside. Perfect getting into sweater weather. So let's get into some questions. Question. Oh, this is Montana Meadow Wool yarn, by the way. <laughs> um, as always, I've linked to the pattern in the description box below. First question. Um, I wondered how you store your sweaters. Do you fold them, roll them? Pretty sure you don't hang them. I'm starting to wear my sweaters from last season. I fold them and some have creases on the body or sleeves. Help! How do you keep them fresh and new looking? Thanks so much. So it is, I thought this was such a perfect question for getting into this chillier weather, at least in these parts. So I don't do anything super special. We have a very old house and in our house we have this really interesting built-in. I have no idea what it was for, but it basically looks like on one wall, like there's drawers, but when you open it up, it's actually just this, the drawer face just folds down. It's just an empty space. Perfect for knit sweaters. So I do fold my sweaters. I don't roll them, although rolling them I do think would help with the crease situation. But generally what I try to do is if this sweater was lying flat, I bring my sleeves over across the yoke and then I fold up the bottom and then maybe I fold it in half again, then going the other way. So what I try to avoid is folding on this center line just in half because I feel, yeah, I get the same crease. The only time I do fold right there, right out the gate is for something like a cardigan or maybe the weekender that has that faux seam. So it's okay to have that kind of fold line there. Um, so you could try that basically again, I just fold the sleeves over the yoke to help give some cushion so that when I do fold the body in half, there it's not a tight crease it's more of like a curve and then i feel like i don't get that line so much um but another thing you could consider is a handheld steamer you can find them in a home goods store online and i think i have a pretty cheap little one um but that can be great too you can then just hang your sweater up and just steam out that crease um, so that is an option too, to kind of help with it. I definitely don't hang them. I love that you pointed that out. So I don't ever recommend hanging a sweater. Putting the weight of a sweater on a hanger is going to really disrupt these stitches on the shoulder. I think it causes weak points and it just doesn't look good. Like you can see those stitches kind of start to open a little bit. Um, so I definitely don't like to hang my sweaters. The only time I do it is for like a trunk show for a short period of time. And even then I'm like, eh. um, so yeah, I like to definitely keep them flat, but I think rolling is another great option, especially if you have the space to then kind of put them all together. And I don't worry so much. Like you can't really, can you see a crease going down my sleeves? I don't think so. I don't, oh, there's a little one. I don't really worry about the sleeve crease. I do know that that bothers a lot of people. Um, I just... It doesn't really bother me. Again, if it does, I think the steamer would be a good way to get out that little sleeve crease. All right, next question. Will superwash merino wool grow after blocking if it's combined with nylon? Also, are there any other fibers that when combined with the superwash will prevent it from growing? So we've definitely talked on here before about how, especially if you're substituting in a super wash yarn into a pattern that doesn't call for it, we've discussed how you need to be careful because that super wash yarn is probably going to grow a lot more than a non super wash yarn. Um, I do think that certain things can help that. Nylon, I have always still seen a lot of growth. I'm assuming you mean a yarn blend. So there's a lot of merino nylon, so, um, not just sock yarns, but a lot of them are sock yarns, but there's a lot of merino nylon yarns out there. And I still find that they grow. I've never compared to see how that affects the growth compared to a 
merino yarn that doesn't have that nylon, I would definitely think that plays a part, but you are still going to see some growth. And I will also say twist affects it. Um, you know, I have some super wash yarns that are a little toothier and they have a really tight twist on them. And I find those don't grow as much as some of the other yarns I might have that are really like soft and drapey. Those ones seem to grow the most. One thing that I've enjoyed playing with that I think helps is holding that yarn with like a silk core yarn. So it could just be a silk yarn. It could be a mohair or like a Surrey alpaca, one of those kind of fun fuzzy yarns with the nice halo. Those add a really inter interesting texture to your fabric. They also are gonna help that stability factor because that silk has like zero elasticity. Um, but like, so it doesn't want to stretch at all. Like it's generally, it's strong. And I find that it kind of helps hold things in a little better. So that's always something you could try too. But I think it would be so interesting to do a little experiment and do like just a super wash yarn and then maybe a super wash blend that includes some nylon and then holding it double with something with like a silk core and kind of seeing, okay, what was my rate of growth with all of those? How much did it vary? Um, so anyone out there who likes to get into the weeds with things, go do that experiment and then report back. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll do it. Um, but yeah, that is kind of my thoughts on it. I would love to hear if anybody else knows better. I could imagine that some of you yarn makers or dyers out there might know even more about that than I do because I'm just going off of like my own experience of knitting with those yarns. Next question is about two by two ribbing with a tubular bind off, which I happen to have on this sweater. You probably can't see it from there. I do like a little, oh, I need to, I always have to cover my face and then it's hard because I can't see anything. So I'm like, I hope I'm holding that up to where you can see it. So I'm working two by two ribbing with a tubular bind off for a sleeve in the round. I watched your tutorial and many others on YouTube. However, my right side knit stitches are elongated and slant to the left after I do the rearranging round. But the back side of my work looks perfect, straight and neat. What could I be doing wrong? Could I do a short row turning stitch on the first stitch of the rearranging round so my wrong side would face the outside right side of my sleeve. I hope this makes sense. Thank you so much. So I just had a thought about that. I have many thoughts about that. So let's jump into them. Okay. So you're not doing anything wrong. Mine looks the same. We're working a little mini cable. So to do a two by two tubular bind off, it's kind of a misnomer because you are still doing a one by one tubular bind off. What we do is we swap. I'm going to try and show you my sleeve again. There it is. Nope. Come on, focus. There she is. So what we do is we work two by two ribbing. And then before we're ready to bind off, we do a rearranging row. And what we do is we swap over every other stitch in those columns. And so that we end up with a knit one, purl one pattern. And then we do a regular tubular bind off. But it gives the appearance of a two by two tubular. And I love it. Obviously, I've got it on my sweater right here. <laughs> um, but because we are technically swapping those stitches around, what you're seeing with that slant or that elongation is the fact that you took that stitch and then you swap places with the stitch next to it. So that is kind of inevitable. I am just going to take a little peek at the inside of mine. I do see what you're saying. I think that I, I've thought about this myself. I'm going to try and show again. There she is. So you can see, I do agree, it looks a little bit straighter on the inside. I can still see a slight flaring. Um, for me, I don't feel like once I'm wearing that sweater, I notice it. That's why I think it's worth it and I still like to do a two by two tubular. Um, but in general, a lot of us prefer the wrong side of our ribbing and that's usually down to our purling tension. 
and so on the other side it looks neater than on the front side it can either be your purling tension or the tension of switching from knit to purl so sometimes we have like one leg that kicks out so when you say could i do a short row turning stitch on the first stitch of the rearranging round so my wrong side would face the outside so basically what they're saying is they would work that cuff and then right before they do the rearranging row, they would do a short row so that they could work it the other way. I think you should try it. I have thought about doing the same. Um, I don't think I would ever put it in a pattern because it's finicky, but I think it would be such a fun thing to try. And then if you like it, you have that in your arsenal of little tips and tricks to really polish up your knitting so it's exactly how you like it. And you'll just have to decide, is that short row, um, which I mean, most, especially when it's one turn, you can probably make that look pretty tidy. Um, but that's the only thing I would consider is you are kind of creating a new nuance, if you will, like a new little blip in your work. Um, and just see how well you can hide that and see if it's worth it to do that turn. Uh, but yeah, I think you should try it. And I'm so curious to see what you think of it. Um, I would also love to know if you have done much two by two tubular by nuffs before, and do you feel like you notice it again in the future? Um, and if it bothers you, but I do, I wish there was another way to do that bind off without that rearranging row to kind of keep that nice, but see like here, like my column right here, and I don't know what this is, and maybe I need to play around with it. Maybe somebody who does a lot of cabling might know, because even right here, I can see I have one where it kind of looks like it's kicking out, but then the column next to it looks like perfectly straight and nice. So it's like, how come sometimes I can notice it a little more? But in general, I find like with my arms just resting right here and looking down, I don't see that as much. I'm also wearing a marled sweater. So that does a really nice job of kind of hiding um, that situation. But I do still think it looks really polished. That's why I like to use it. But basically we have to go to a one by one so that you can do the Kitchener stitch. Um, but yeah, it would be fun to dig into. I wonder if anybody's ever figured out any kind of way um, it's actually why I did one by one ribbing for so long because I wanted the tubular bind off and I was like, I don't know how you would do this with two by two. And then I finally learned the two by two method, which is really the one by one. Um, and I was skeptical when I first, I was like, really, that doesn't sound like it's going to work, but I think it still looks really nice. Um, but if you could polish it up even more and get it even more to how you like it, that would be wonderful. So if you give it a try, please come back and tell us how it goes. All right, question number four. I live in a desert climate and don't really have any knitting or spinning friends. I have finally convinced my morning walking buddy to learn to knit, but I'm definitely not a teacher. I think I can get her going with the basics and I have a few books for reference as well as YouTube. But my question is, what is a good pattern or starting place for a virgin knitting hands? I don't want to discourage her with anything too big, but also know that a knitter wants to feel like they're making something other than a square or a swatch. Any suggestions? I've knit two shift cowls this week because it's my go-to comfort pattern. Oh, yay. Um, but not sure if a newbie could do it. Or am I wrong? I don't know. Help me keep her in the game. So I thought this would be a good crowdsourcing one too. I also want to throw in here... I do have a book recommendation. So there is a book that I have personally bought a lot of people I've tried to talk into knitting, like my mom, all my sisters, my best friend, my best friend's daughter. Um, and that's Pom Pom Magazine's Their Beginner Knitter book, which is called Knit How. And I love that because it has beginner friendly knits that kind of build on techniques as you learn them. And it has a wide range a range a wide I don't know what I was trying to say there they have a lot of different patterns like a, a variety variety they have a variety of patterns so I'm pretty sure I know there's 
sweater in there. There's cowl. I'm sure there's a hat. There might even be socks. So I love that it kind of gives you like a basic of each of those patterns as a jumping off board. So that's kind of the book I recommend. I also personally learned, so I learned from my grandma when I was about nine and I came back to it when I was 17, when I was a teenager and I bought Stitch and Bitch and I still have my copy. And that is the book that then taught me everything else. Um, that's how I learned how to increase and decrease because my grandma literally just taught me how to knit. There was no learning to cast on or bind off or purling or anything like that. It was just the knit stitch. Um, but that, that is what planted the seed for everything that followed. So thank you, grandma. Um, but so I also would recommend Stitch and Bitch. I think it is just such a wealth of knowledge. Um, so I do love that book, but if you want like a more modern take, then Knit How is really beautiful. And I love the way that they go about the beginning knitting techniques. I will now say my caveat, I am also, I mean, I do teach knitting, but not beginning knitting. And I don't think I'm very good at it. Um, so I would love, and we've called out for this before, but I think it's always good to, you know, refresh those of you who have taught people to knit successfully, let us know your tips and tricks and advice to help get somebody hooked on knitting. Um, I had always heard that a hat was a great place to start because unlike a scarf, a scarf I think gets boring for people because it's just endless. Like you want to get it to a pretty decent length if you actually want to wear it, where a hat is much smaller and it also teaches a lot of techniques because if you do the brim that can be knit and purl then it's just knitting in the round which is just great muscle memory practice and then you even get to learn decreasing which i think is a good place to start with shaping decreasing like especially if you're just doing a knit two together um can be a great place to end up that being said i did attempt to teach somebody that way and i feel like trying to teach them how to both knit and purl at the same time really confused them that could have been my my teaching uh, prowess failing maybe, but that kind of gave me pause of like, okay, I don't know if a hat's the best place to start, but so I would think maybe a simple tube cowl, um, and I don't mean tube as in Mobius or infinity cowl, although that could be fun too. I mean just more like a straight up cast on however many stitches joined to work in the round and just knit that tube, you know, for 10 inches and then bind off. I feel like that could be a good starting place because you could avoid the purling. You could, unless you wanted to do garter and do knit, purl, knit, purl, and then they wouldn't be adjusting it every two stitches. It would be every other row. So they would get a full round of knits and then a full round of purls. I think that might be a little bit more intuitive to tackle right out the gate than having to switch every one to two stitches, like in ribbing. Um... But you know, so they learn to cast on, bind off, and knit. So I do think that that could be a fun place to start too. And I feel like a lot of people would wear their first cowl because even if it's funky, you know, that gauge is all over the place, it just hangs around your neck. Unlike a hat where I'm like, if that gauge is too all over the place, how well is it gonna fit? I don't know. Um, so anyways, that's kind of what pops into my head is a cowl to get somebody hooked. Um, but I would love to know what other people think. And as far as the shift cowl, I do think that there's some tricky things in there with the shaping, the mosaic, the high cords. <laughs> but you always hear about those unicorns who start off knitting a lace shawl or an all over cabled fisherman sweater as their very first project and they complete it successfully because they just didn't know any better that that was kind of a hard project to start with. So you never know. I mean, I think sometimes too, we shouldn't shy away from those more complicated things because that might be what hooks that person. Maybe that's the way their brain works as they really like like those kind of more complicated puzzles. So um, yeah, everyone else who knows how to teach somebody how to knit, please let us know in the comments below and I'll link that book, Knit How, um, in the description box. We are all ready to the last question. My question is entirely unfiber related. Dun, dun, dun. 
I often notice a beautiful little orchid beside your desk in your videos. Um, how do you get it to bloom for so long? Mine bloomed once for a week and then went back to being just a green plant again. If it's a silk plant, please don't break my heart and tell me. Thank you again for all that you share with the fiber community. It is not, it is not a silk plant. It is a real plant. I'll lift it up here. I will say two of its blooms just fell off today. Oh, this was my Mother's Day present, I think this past year. And this is probably the second or third time it's bloomed. So I am, I do not have a green thumb. I will say we do have some house plants and they're hanging on by a thread. <laughs> so the only thing I seem to be able to keep alive, shockingly, are orchids. I don't know why. It's the one thing that I seem to be kind of okay with. Even after I really neglect them, there was one that I had that was just neglected for, I mean, almost a year. And one day I just was like, mm, and I gave it some water and it came back. So I do think that they're a little hardier than we assume. I should also, again, preface this by saying, as I just said, I do not have a green thumb. I don't know a lot about orchids. Um, so this is coming from an amateur. <laughs> there are people who know way more than I do and might be able to give better advice. But I have successfully gotten them to stay alive and to rebloom a plenty. So basically what I do is, generally speaking, I like to do the ice cube trick with watering orchids so that I don't overwater them. So I find with most of my, that's my biggest one, my other ones are a little bit smaller, but I generally do two ice cubes once a week to water them. And so I just take those ice cubes and I'm talking about a standard size ice cube. Um, and I just put them on there and they melt and they kind of slowly water the orchid. That has seemed to always work well with me. But here's the real trick. Plant food. Who would have thought <laughs> those plants need a little plant food and then they seem to get really happy. Every time I do the plant food, they blow. So that's really my deep, dark, dirty secret is a little bit of plant food and it makes them quite happy. And then just watering with those ice cubes. So that's it. That's all I do. Oh, another tip I heard that I do think is true because this one I really sometimes do neglect and will be like, oh, when's the last time I watered that one? Um, but its blooms have stayed so long. I mean, for weeks, those blooms will hang on. And I think it's in a really happy spot. So I think the amount of light and everything it gets seems to be working really well for it. And one time I got a tip that said, when your plants are happy, don't move them around. Like if they've, if you found a happy spot where your plant seems to be thriving, leave them in that spot. So that's, I have decided that seemed to be good advice and I follow that advice. I just leave them where they are if they are doing well. So this one seems pretty happy right here. All right, that's about it. I unfortunately can't show you anything this week because it's all still a secret, but I'm excited. I do have some show and tells I get to finally show you next week. I just finished up a new pattern that I'm so excited about. I was in a little bit of a creative dry spell there where, oh, you know, you can't force it. And I was like, man, I just feel like I'm not happy with anything I'm coming up with. And then I just had this moment of inspiration and it was something I had never done before. I mean, it's a shawl. Well, I'll tell you that much. So I've knit shawls, but it was a completely different way to do it and so I just started with a bunch of little swatches and I halfway through was like I wonder if I do this if it'll work and it did and it was so much fun that I feel like it like relit all my creative fires and I'm like oh, just so excited again so that felt really good to get through that little dry spell and then to feel so inspired and excited and like, oh my gosh, I don't want to put this down and now I want to knit all the things. So that always feels really good to just push through and get to the other side. All right. 
that's all I got this week. So I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. If you have a question that you want to ask, you can find a form below. It's at the very bottom of the description box. You can just click that link. It takes you to a form to fill out, which helps me find your question. And that's it. I hope to see you back here next week. Have a fantastic weekend. And thanks for spending a little time with me today. Bye.